Good morning. We're going to talk about what we're going to talk about today is a is calf health and productivity. And you might think that with the title the management equation for calf and health and productivity, we're going to talk about math today. We're not actually. But I want you to think about managing these calves when you're backgrounding, when you're weaning. Uh, think about it in a kind of an equation uh, setting. And so that's what we're going to cover today. We'll cover a little bit on vaccines as well. Just a reminder that that you and I that deal with livestock, we have a stewardship responsibility. And the definition of stewardship is careful and responsible management of things entrusted to one's care. And these cattle have been entrusted to us and we need to do our very best in all aspects of management to make sure that they stay healthy and that they're productive. I wanna start here just, just to give you some expectations. We wean calves all over the country, I guess in reality all over the world, but we wean calves all over the country and we do it in different ways and different fashions and some involves different stressors than, than what we experience up here. And so if I look across the country, there's probably a, a an expectation of 0% sick ones to up to 50% and even higher sick cattle. And an expectation for death loss or mortality from 0% to 5% and sometimes even higher. And that's due primarily to the bovine respiratory, respiratory disease complex. So there's quite a range in sickness, quite a range in mortality, and it depends on how well we're managing some of those risk, those stress issues that we're gonna talk about in this presentation. This is just a reminder to us all that we haven't actually been doing better on, on morbidity and mortality. This is death loss over the last 20 years or so. Uh, this, now granted, this comes from the feed yard, which is a little bit different than what we're talking about. We're talking about weaning and backgrounding. But this is death loss from 1990 through 2011, and we've gone from maybe perhaps, in steers at least, maybe 0.75% death loss, and now we're up at almost 1.5%. We've basically doubled in death loss over the last 20 years or so, and we're not doing any better. We have better vaccines, we have better antibiotics, but something's missing and we're going to talk about some of those issues that I think need to uh, have more attention paid to it from a management standpoint. Here's your math equation and it's really not because each place and each operation is a little bit different in terms of the stressors that, it get, that are involved here. But I've called this the health assurance or you could call this a systems approach to health. Either way it works, and the first bullet point, it says there is a relationship of calf health, an expression of the genetic potential of those animals to a set of risk management factors. And so I put it this way. The second bullet point is calf health and productivity equals, and what I mean by that equals how well we handle all of those potential stressors that come into the life of that calf, starting when it's born, starting when it's in utero, all the way through to when it's weaned and actually to when it's finished and goes to slaughter. So let's just think about each one and then the next slide I'll just show you some pictures of what I'm really talking about. So the first one I've got is failure of passive transfer. And I, I could qualify that a bit and say it's partial failure of passive transfer. And, and what that means, and I put immune stress there, what that means is that that calf when it was in utero, being fed by its mother through her diet and her exposure to the environment, and how it was born, what kind of stressors were involved when that calf was born. In other words, calving ease, uh, birth weight, what time of the year was there environmental stress when it was born. Any of those things that are involved with that calf, whether it's in utero or when there were the circumstances as to which it was born, can have an impact on whether that calf picks up immunity from its mother. We call that maternal immunity that is derived from the colostrum, from that first milk that that calf gets up and nurses. Anything that interrupts that transfer can cause that calf to be at greater risk of sickness and greater risk of, of death loss even later in life. It doesn't just apply to early in life, but it even, even applies to later on in life and to that expression of the genetic potential. Second one I have is weaning, and I call that a psychological stress, because now I've got calves that have been removed from their mother 
and in many cases it's still just a companion relationship as as in some circumstances the milk that the the, uh, the nutrition that's derived from milk from the cow has is not what it once was the, the amount is not there and so but you still have this com loss of companionship and i would say loss of that pacifier that produces a psychological stress on those calves and thirdly, and sometimes this is the most important one that we forget about, is commingling stress. Most of our ranchers in the northern plains don't put all the cow and calf pairs out on the same pasture. They're in many different pastures. And so under an abrupt weaning strategy, when we remove all the calves from the cows at the same time and put them all in a pen or even a grass trap together, those those groups now have to reestablish pecking order and it's kind of a social stress and that can bring on signs of, cl of clinical disease, signs of respiratory disease just from commingling all by itself. The fourth one I've got is environmental stress. This relates to when those cows calve in the springtime. Is it a difficult environment that they calve in? It also re relates to the, the environmental stress that may be placed on those calves at weaning time. Are we weaning at a time when we've got snow and wet rain and cold and temperature fluctuations all of those can contribute to an environmental stress the fifth one i've got is nutrition are we providing enough energy and protein and trace mineral to meet those calves need once they come off pasture once they've lost whatever uh, milk nutrition that they're getting is the is the the ration palatable so they know how to eat it um, so there can be nutrition stress in the life of those calves as well the, the uh, sixth one is exposure stress. And this comes sometimes from just the weaning process, sometimes from commingling, uh, sometimes from exposure to, cal to cattle that may, may be close by those calves that are freshly weaned. But exposure to pathogen stress, it could also be exposure to things like bovine virus, diarrhea virus with uh, calves or animals that are PI positive, which means persistently infected and they've been infected since birth and they're shedding that virus continually until they die. The seventh one there is the immune response. And we, we hoped that our immune response that's generated after vaccination is not a stressor. It can be if we overload those calves with too many vaccines. But a lack of response is certainly a stress in the life of those calves when we're trying to protect them against specific pathogens, but they don't respond very well. Now we've made them more susceptible to uh, some of those potential pathogens. Instead of seemingly trying to protect them, we've made them more uh, susceptible because we have a lack of response stress. And finally, this one's important too. In the Northern Plains, we don't have an ample supply of labor and many times labor is lacking in both quantity and quality. And if you don't have people that know how to how to take care of cattle, uh, how to recognize when cattle aren't feeling well and need attention, that's a labor stress that that is applied in this whole system. So what I'm suggesting here is that when we talk about weaning, when we talk about backgrounding, we have to address each of these issues in some manner Otherwise, we're going to be disappointed in the results that we that we achieve. This next slide is just a kind of a pictorial um, display of all those things I just talked about. And then lower left hand corner, I've got a cow, cow giving birth to a calf. And I talked about in utero environmental stress to that cow, in utero nutrition to that calf. And it makes a difference in that calf's life makes a difference in the amount of maternal immunity he can pick up when he gets up and nurses. And as well, I've put in their birth weight and calving ease. Is that calf born with assistance or without assistance or even without assistance? Was it a difficult birth, which causes that calf to not want to get up and nurse right away and get all the maternal immunity that he needs and requires in his system so that he stays healthy and stays productive throughout his entire life. And that that scenario can apply to the calving in the weaning season as well. The calving season, if there's environmental stress in that cow's life, in that calf's life, when that calf's being born, that prevents him from getting up and nursing at, and uh, getting maternal immunity in a, into his system, just like I said. And the same holds true for the weaning season. Are we weaning under environmental stress with rain and wet and difficult pen conditions, which puts more stress on those calves' lives? 
And and in many cases, what I just talked about with the calving and, and, and stress during that time, we can have calves that are sick when they're really young. And that's displayed with that picture in the top there, in the middle of the top. But but we can go beyond there and keep piling on, if I could use that term. How do we wean those calves? Are we weaning them into a, an environment that they're totally unfamiliar with? Are we trying to low stress weaning with the cows close by? Um, so there's there's a number of different things that we can can utilize to take some of that stress out of this weaning procedure and and sometimes maybe it's later weaning that that helps remove some of that stress when the the milk supply from the cow is dried up to a point where they really are more interested in finding their own feed that can lower that that weaning or that psychological stress this this little picture here is to, is a reminder that commingling can occur even on ranches of origin when we bring calves that have not been together during the suckling phase we bring them and throw them all together at one time one of the ways to avoid that stress is to actually feed cows and calves the entire group together so that over a period of time maybe it's a week's time the ca the calves get used to one another that they haven't been used to for the the suckling phase and they're eating along with the, the mothers so they're learning how to eat it takes a lot of that risk. It, 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 it applies a management strategy to that commingling. This one relates to exposure and biosecurity and vaccination. This is a calf that has BVD in its system, was born with BVD in its system and, will sh and has been shedding BVD in it to its other herd mates throughout the entire summer, throughout the entire weaning phase. And that's a stressor to, to the other calves that have not been exposed to this calf because it's, a, it's an immune suppressor. And, and makes those calves more susceptible to developing respiratory disease and actually other conditions as well. And then, and then how do we handle those calves, whether it be at processing or whether it be transportation, are we applying low stress um, handling techniques to those calves such that we don't end up with a picture like this, with a calf that's now been weaned in the feedlot, we're trying to get it to grow and gain and express its genetic potential with the feed we provide, but it's not coming to the bunk because it's sick. So those are things that I want all of you to think about as you, as you go through the wing phase, as you go through the backgrounding phase. Have I addressed all of those issues? You see, this is a systems approach to health and it starts, doesn't start the day you wean. It started a long time ago uh, when the cow was pregnant, when she calved, uh, when, she, when you weaned those calves, how you weaned them how you handle commingling, how you handled exposure to other pathogens, and how you handle them during even transportation and processing. So think about all those things when you're, even for this year, but, but even for next year, you have to start planning ahead for next year as well. I just put this slide in there just to remind us of the impact of stress. And I've got a funny looking Star Wars image in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, and that's that's, it's a picture of what we call a dendritic cell. And that just simply means that this cell that all of you have in your own body is the cell that processes the bad bugs that you might be exposed to or the bad bugs that you've received through a vaccine. If this cell isn't working very properly because it's been stressed by all the things that I just mentioned, I have a picture in the lower right hand corner of calves that are at the bunk, but there's a whole lot of environmental stress on those calves. This cell that's that I'm demonstrating right here does not work very well if I've got too much stress in the system. And what we end up seeing is not this cell, but we end up seeing clinical di disease such as bovine respiratory disease. I'm going to throw this out for just some conversation because this is trying to highlight Sometimes we look in the wrong places for trying to solve problems. This is a bull test station. I was sent this email a number of years ago, and I'm, I'm just going to read it to you like it was sent to me. As per a vaccination protocol sent to the bull test years ago by someone at the vet school, incoming bulls must be vaccinated two to three weeks prior to arrival. That makes sense, of course. We're trying to boost that immunity to a level that will prevent an infection and, and hopefully clinical disease caused by these pathogens right here. IBR, PI3, BRSV, BVD type 1 and 2, and then also Mannheimia hemolytica, 
Pastor Alamaltasada, Histophilus somnus, we do call it Histophilus somnus anymore, instead of Haemophilus, and then Clostridial seven way. Not that Clostridial seven way is a respiratory condition, but they're giving all these vaccines at the same time, which you could call into question. Maybe it's too much at once. But we're trying to prevent these pathogens from producing clinical disease. So they're vaccinated two to three weeks prior to arrival. And then when they're processing them on arrival, in other words, two or three weeks after this, they're giving boosters, which makes sense. And they're giving whatever vaccines Zoetis and BI donate. That's all the information I have. So here was the question and a little more of the scenario. Typically processing, processing in is around July 5. This, as you can tell, this is in the South. And the bulls are sold around December 7th. Within seven to 10 days after arrival, there are numerous cases of bovine respiratory disease, which are treated and may be treated and the process really runs to late November. So the question was if the protocol pre-arrival and at processing was an intranasal administered vaccine, like TSV2, or, and an intermuscular or sub-Q manhemia, pastorella, plus clostridial, and omitting the homophilus, would there be less BRD? I would appreciate your advice. There, there's some hints in there, and I'm just going to tell you right now that vaccine protocols almost are never an issue. Okay. Hopefully we can come back to this one and talk about what the real issue is here in this case report. I'm just going to talk about this a little bit because this relates to um, disease and it relates to uh, the immune response. I've got on that first bullet point, it says BRD, bovine respiratory disease incubation time is seven to 10 days. What that means is that in general, very general terms, if an animal is exposed and stress at, at a certain time, it's going to be seven to 10 days before you're going to see clinical disease. That's what that incubation time means. And with enough stress, that actually can be shortened. It may be as soon as three, four, or five days, but typically it's seven to 10 days. If I look on the other side, a measurable immune response takes a while. It takes three to 10 days maybe to begin. And if I have very naive calves and we measure protection by antibody response, which is not the greatest way to measure protection, but that's how we measure it, that it'll peak, that immune response will peak in somewhere in two to four weeks. That doesn't always match up with this. So I can have disease showing up prior to when I get a maximum immune response. And that can happen if I've piled on those calves, all those stresses that I talked about before, and they haven't been immunized properly. I can be behind the curve and not catch up. Let's talk a little bit about vaccination protocols. We're going to talk about this and, and I want you to, to, uh, Think about your own vaccination protocol, and I'm hoping you're involved, your veterinarian, in building vaccination protocols for the calves that you're going to wean and or buying calves that you're going to background. There's three questions think I think need to be asked whether um, when I'm putting together a vaccination protocol. Is it necessary? In other words, is there a reasonable risk of pathogen exposure in infection and clinical disease? And you could answer yes to many things. Is there a reasonable risk of exposure to manhemium hemolytica, to pastorella, to hemophilus? The answer is yes. But then I'm going to ask the next question. Are the vaccines we currently have, are they, do they work? Are they effective? Is there a reasonable expectation through research, through anecdotal information, through observation that the vaccine is effective? And that's where some of these vaccines tend to fall out of place, at least for me. When I look at the science behind some of our vaccines today, it's very questionable whether they're effective or not. And if, if I can't answer number two, I'm probably going to leave it out. And then finally, are they safe to use? There, there must be a reasonable expectation that the vaccine is safe to use. In other words, minimal local tissue and systemic reactions to a vaccine. For example, I'll just give you this example. If I use a, a modified live IBR vaccine in a pregnant cow that's never been immunized or never been exposed to IBR, there might be a reasonable expectation that I can have a systemic reaction and that might be an abortion in that cow. So I want to answer all these three questions in my own mind whether I'm going to recommend somebody use a vaccine. Is it necessary? Is it effective? And is it safe to use? And I should also say safe to use in combination with other vaccines. 
Just a reminder to us all that many of these vaccines do require booster doses, especially killed vaccines and even modified live vaccines in many cases. So when I give the first dose, I get a primary response and we're measuring antibody as a way to measure protection, which isn't always correct, but it's what we typically measure. So I give that dose of vaccine here. I get a response here. When I come back, maybe it's three weeks later, maybe it could be even as short as, four, as two weeks. Three to four weeks later, I give another dose that's a booster dose, and I'm hoping for a secondary response that's much greater than the first one. We've actually come out here at like 150, 150 days later and seen a, a response from a vaccine given way back here. So there's some things that we can learn from some of the studies that were done that this booster dose doesn't necessarily have to go in just at, at three to four weeks later. It can actually be much longer than that three to four week later time span. So the question becomes, if I manage some of those risk factors, will it make a difference on actual health of those calves? So I'm gonna share with you a study that we did, and this would be trying to manage the immune response and trying to manage um, commingling and trying to manage weaning. We're not doing really anything about environmental stressors. I don't know anything about failure of passive transfer. I don't know really a whole lot about nutrition stress. I'm not sure about the labor stress, but we're trying to measure or trying to manage some of these stressors that I talked about earlier. Does it make a difference or not? Many, are, many of you are familiar with the Weanback program. It was at old Smith Klein Beecham, uh, then Pfizer, now Zoetis program where calves have to receive certain vaccines and have to be weaned for a certain period of time. And uh, so we're gonna talk about a trial that was done way back in 2003. The cattle in this study originated in the Southeast USA, were purchased at the Joplin Regional Stockyard in Carthage, Missouri during December, 2003. Cattle were trucked to Decatur County Feed Yard, Nobleland, Kansas, where they were fed until May. And then at that time, it was an XL plant shipped to Dodge City, Kansas for slaughter. The original, original intent was to have four treatment groups in here. The treatment one was controls. Uh, those were unweaned calves, an unknown health history at the time of sale. There was a T2, which was the actual wean vac program at that time by Pfizer. Calves were weaned for at least 45 days prior to sale. They were bunk broke and tank broke or water broke. In other words, they knew what they were and had received vaccinations according to Pfizer's select vac program. T3 was a pre-vac program without the weaning. And there turned out there was not enough calves in that that could be purchased at that time. And so that treatment group was eventually dropped out of the analysis. And then there was a T4, and that was basically identical to T2, the weanvac program. It was just a different company-sponsored weaning program. Again, those steers were weaned for at least 45 days and then qualified for another health program. Just gonna show you the results related to health. On the calves, here's T1 right here. This is T1. Calves of un, unweaned with unknown health history, they ended up with somewhere around a 42.63% morbidity or sickness rate. The calves in both of these other wean vac programs were about 15%. So in other words, what this is telling us is that these calves were four times more likely to become ill than calves that were in these other weaning programs, okay? Very significant statistics right here, okay? So what, what's the difference between these two? Well, we know there's a vaccine difference and there's a weaning difference, right? So that, that actually seemed to make it made a difference in the health and productivity of, of these calves. Broke that one down just a little bit further because I wanted us to look at what really goes on in a feed yard. This is the T1 calves here again. And, and these are the one the steers that were pulled one time, about 26.3%. Some of those same steers had to be pulled twice, about 9%. Some of them had to be pulled three times, and that, that's 7.4%. Here's the other two uh, VAC, wean VAC programs, 13%, 1, 1, uh, 12%, 3, and 3. So it gives you a little bit of breakdown of, 
of the the health status, how many acts had to be pulled twice, how many pulled three times, based on on those different treatment groups. So here we've got un, unweaned, unknown health history versus those weaning and wean vac programs. I actually plotted a disease curve, and all I did here was take the the, the one wean vac group and plotted it against the control group and looked at how many pulls I had by day over time. I want you to look at this disease curve. So I started getting calves that were sick even by day two, day three, day four. So it tells us if we think back to that incubation periods, someplace back here, those calves were starting to get stress. Maybe it was just going through the auction market. Maybe it was just being pulled off the cow way back here someplace. So I, I've started building stress in those calves already. And now by the time they get there, they're pretty stressed. They've been exposed at the sale barn. And now I've got calves that are starting to get sick really early on, okay? Let's compare that with the weanback calves. I got maybe one or so that was sick on day four. Day five, I really never, I got a little bit of a peak here, but it just kind of trailed off, had a few sick along here. The point I want to make about this is remember the difference here. These were unweaned, uh, unvaccinated calves, um, highly commingled, these were weaned and vaccinated, but they were also commingled. We have to remember that is that these groups came in smaller groups and they're still commingled. So we're seeing the effects of commingling here, but it certainly doesn't reach the level of those that are commingled and not weaned and not vaccinated. Huge difference here in these peaks. And what's interesting about this whole thing is that these two groups here, they actually had BVDPI animals in it. And there seemed to be some protection that was conferred simply by weaning those calves and getting them vaccinated before they went to the feed yard. A really interesting portion of this study. This is just looking at the death rate. Uh, unweaned, unvaccinated calves, 1.2%. And those others kind of trailed behind them. These calves here were four times more likely to, be, to die versus the calves in the in the weanback program. I also broke down this a little bit further and I looked at calves that were just sick at least one time versus those that were well, that would never got sick. 336 head here, over 1,000 head here in the, in the group that was well. Average daily gain 3.07 versus 3.50 in the calves that remained healthy. So it's not just the, the medicine expense, but it's certainly a a productivity issue here, right? It's health and productivity because these calves gain much better. Even though these remained healthy after being treated, they never did quite catch up again. So I'm going to share with you a report here of, a, of another case I had a number of years ago, it happened to be in South Dakota. This is a picture of the operation here. You can see a big lot and they had bale feeders out. They had a bunk line back over here that you can't really see. And then they had another bale feeder someplace over here. And they, so, and what, I'll give you the, the uh, history on these calves. So these were five to 600 weight calves, uh, approximately 400 head. They were springborn calves, approximately six to eight months of age. Calves had been weaned into a common pen. That's the one I just showed you by groups over a time period of four weeks, beginning in late September and in the month of October. Approximately three to five weeks after the first group was weaned, clinical signs of respiratory disease were observed. Number of calves, 20 to 30 per day, appeared ill and were treated, and a small number died. Upon recommendation by the attending veterinarians, the entire group was administered an antibiotic and boosted with two different vaccines. The outbreak was slowed, and two calves have died since the intervention. So is this product failure? These calves were vaccinated before weaning. What's the real issue here? I'm just going to use my marker to point this out to you. Here's, here's the issue here. Calves were weaned, had been weaned into a common pen by groups over a time period of four weeks. That means they weren't all weaned at the same time. They kept bringing more calves and more calves that were going through this weaning phase and putting them all together at the same time. It was a different management strategy that they had done in the past and they were so busy with corn harvest, they didn't get this thing managed properly. Typically they would wean calves, move them out to a different place and then bring in a new group, which is what they should have been doing. But corn harvest preempted everything and now they got in trouble with sick and dead calves. 
And I might also point out, going back to that first case report I gave you, when you're bringing bulls from different sources, bringing them into a bull test station, it's commingling that's overwhelming everything. It has nothing to do with the products, the vaccine products that they're using. Just a quick little reminder about treatment schedules. I want your, you to work with your veterinarian to develop treatment schedules for what condition you're treated, what you're going to use for treatment, uh, what the dose is, how to administer it, and the withdrawal time. Work with your veterinarian on, on these issues. And this is just a reminder about treatment. Don't wait to see if cattle get better. Pull, which means diagnose and treat sick cattle promptly. Don't treat the morning pulls in the in the afternoon or the afternoon pulls in the following morning. Treat as if it's life-threatening. Follow those written treatment schedules. And there may be times when you have a group of animals that have have to all receive medication at once. We do this in more often in the stalker uh, industry where we have high levels of commingling and transportation stress on those calves all at once. So sometimes we'll use it on high risk animals when the expectation is that a significant number, percentage of those animals will become ill. And sometimes we even have to use it in order to shut down an outbreak in our home raised, home weaned calves. I hope that's not the case because we have managed those other risk categories that I talked about. Just a final reminder about veterinary feed directive. When we use antibiotics in the feed, this comes under the veterinary feed directive uh, policy. And it's just a, a permission slip basically written by your veterinarian that allows you to use medicated feed in livestock. And we still use uh, some of these medicated feeds today. I would say the most common one we use today are the, the tetracyclines. And in many cases, it's a, it's a drug called oreomycin. This is a quick, easy way to determine how to fill out a, a veterinary feed directive for the veterinarian. You can see up here is the veteran's name and address. It has your client's name and address, and it goes through the labels and the, the uh, directions for feeding of an animal. So for example, if I've got a group of calves that I believe are sick as a veterinarian, and you come and we talk about it, and I look at those calves, I may need to treat those animals, and that says calves, beef, and non-lactating dairy cattle for the treatment of bacterial enteritis, which is diarrhea, caused by E. coli or bacterial pneumonia caused by pastoral multocida. And I may need to treat them. So I'm going to put an X here or check mark. And I'm let's say I'm going to use a top dress and I'm going to use the 10 at 10 milligrams per pound body weight, which is the label dose. And I'm going to use the 20,000 grams per ton. OK, which is 10 grams per pound product. And then I'm going to finish that off by signing my name. If I'm your veterinarian, when I issued it, I'm going to put in the number of cattle that I may need to be treated. It might be 100, might be 400. And I might check one of these boxes if I'm using some other drug with it. Fairly easy, fairly straightforward that a veterinarian can, can utilize this to give you permission to use some of those feed additive antibiotics. Let me just finish up with a couple things here. This was a... Uh, kind of a survey that was done a number of years ago by Cattlefax. I want us to concentrate maybe down here someplace. The question was, a couple of questions. Do you have a vet client patient relationship? Well, I certainly hope so. This is this NP stands for Northern Plains. That's you and I. Yes, it says 86%. Do I have a vaccination plan for a cow herd? Yes, developed on my own, 79%. Yes, developed with my vet, 17%. Um, I'm hoping that's 100%. I'm hoping that 100% of you will develop a vaccine protocol or a plan for your cow herd and your calves with your veterinarian. But maybe even more important regarding the use of antibiotics. Do you use antibiotics? Most will use some level of antibiotics. Where do you gather info about using antibiotics? Do I use it on advice from a veterinarian familiar with my cow herd? 52% advice from a veterinarian familiar with my cow herd. I want that to be 100%. As all of you know, we are under scrutiny these days for the use of antibiotics. I want you to use your veterinarian to decide what you need to use, when you use it, how to use it, what to use it for.
covered a lot of issues in this slide deck. Just want you to rem remember that the, the management equation when we're talking about health and productivity revolves around addressing all of these issues here in one way, shape or form. Uh, if I've had trouble, try and identify which of these issues here is still causing you trouble as it relates to health and productivity. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, uh, you certainly can contact me either through email, uh, cell phone, or through NDSU. Thank you.